uh, kinase inhibitor, uh, erlotinib, uh, gave patients a few weeks, um, a, a, a few weeks uh, additional survival. Actually, interestingly, this was approved on the basis of only two to three weeks in increase in, survi in survival. And a lot of physicians, uh, a lot of hematologists, oncologists have now uh, decided uh, uh, not to use this. Um, and a lot of uh, the reason for this came out of our understanding of lung cancer. And we know that patients that generally have an underlying mutation of, uh, of mutation of RAS downstream of EGFR, uh, if you, you know, if you're treating EGFR upstream and they already have a downstream mutation, it's probably not a, a, a large benefit, but th there's some argument there. And then there, there's this, um, uh, you know, came into a vote uh, for Fernox, uh, uh, this combinational um, uh, uh, chemotherapeutic regimen. Uh, but the problem with this regimen uh, is that you, met, you that it's generally restricted to patients that have a, a good physical status uh, because this is a very uh, you know uh, tough uh, tough regimen and, uh, uh, and not everyone can tolerate it. Uh, I, I think one of the interesting um, uh, new therapeutics is going to be or, or already is a Braxane, which is FDA approved. And it's an albumin formulated paxitaxel. And uh, it seems to work better than paxitaxel simply because albumin, um, uh, if you talk to uh, Dan Bonhoff, who, who originated the, who started the original trial, he claims that the albumin um, uh, will actually attack the um, extracellular matrix components and, and um, uh, the decimal, uh, decimal plasia, that high level of decimal plasia associated with uh, pancreatic cancer, and helps break down decimal plasia and cause decimal plastic collapse, helps get more drug to the, uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, to the site. Uh, but now I've seen some studies where they're combining uh, gemcitabine and anabrexin. But these patients have been shown, the uh, early studies suggest that these patients will survive about uh, 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 11 months, some studies uh, a little bit uh, longer. So there seems to be some advantage. But the bottom line is all these uh, patients uh, that are treated with these regimens, uh, uh, they uh, eventually have progressive uh, disease. And, uh, and, we, and as I already said, that, uh, there's limited objective responses uh, with gemcitabine alone, although some patients do initially respond. And we'll talk about why they, they probably uh, don't respond for long term. Uh, we, we term uh, there's a term called adaptive tumor responses. It, it has many uh, meanings and connotations. Uh, we know, for example, that tumors uh, respond. Uh, uh, they, they, they respond uh, to to the microenvironment. You know, depending on microenvironmental influences, microenvironmental signaling, uh, cytokines released in the microenvironment, and to chemotherapy. But some reasons for uh, these types of adaptive uh, tumor cell responses. There's a there's genetic variability within the tumor, not only between tumors. We used to think, well, this tumor is different than this tumor, but if you look at a tumor uh, and you start taking these punch biopsies and doing uh, genetic analysis, uh, there's difference in genetic. Yeah. Is this related to like uh, different uh, phenotype of cell develop during the tumor in the career? So you have, like you mentioned, a uh, response completely different in the dark? I'm sorry, uh, so I mean... Uh, what I'm asking, uh, if this is related to a different phenotype of cell, the uh, yeah, yeah, not the different phenotypes, uh -huh. but different gen genotypes. Genotypes, okay. Within a given tumor. Within. Okay. Yeah, so this is becoming more and more impaired. These people are, so a lot of these molecular epidemiologists are taking punch biopsies of, of, a, of a tumor, of a part of a tumor here, part of the tumor here, part of the tumor here, and we're finding uh, clear, uh, clear, difference, uh, clear differences. Uh, so the tumors with a given tumor mass have heterogeneity, but not only phenotypic heterogeneity, but gen uh, genetic heterogeneity. Uh, this acquired resistance, uh, really an interesting topic, is acquired resistance, uh, uh, to, especially to biologically targeted agents. Uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, the old, the, 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 
the thing with, uh, for example, one of the uh, best examples of this is, is gastrointestinal stromal tumors, GIST. Right? So if you treat GIST, so what happened with GIST, you know, in the last decade? We found out that GIST tumors were, uh, uh, were, were, were sensitive to, um, many of them were sensitive to imatinib because uh, they have activated mutations of CKIT, and CKIT uh, kinase domain looks just like, very much like uh, BCRA, ABLE, and the ABLE kinase domain, uh, kinase domain looks very similar. So imatinib uh, uh, works against CKIT activating mutations and just how most all of them have CKIT mutations. They respond very nicely. You can see people have these widespread uh, sarcomas, gastrointestinal sarcoma, and, and, and you treat them with and they, 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 they dissolve. They, like, they go, away, out, go away. But always in a, couple, in a year, two years, they start coming back. And if you look at the genetics of those tumors, they undergo uh, secondary mutations. Uh, and as secondary mutations, we, we, they're called acquired mutations, and they create resistance to matinea. Luckily, uh, some other kinase, uh, newer kinases like serafinib, sutinib, uh, they now work. So matinib quits working, you give them the next kinase inhibitor. And it still fits in the kinase domain and still works. Uh, and we begin to understand that. that that's different from what I want to talk. So today I want to talk to you about just adaptive plasticity. And the, these are uh, semi, uh, phenotypic changes. And, and, and an example I'm going to give you, and, and, uh, and most of you have heard of EMT. Yeah. Uh, so epithelial mesenchymal transition. So it's when a, you have an epithelial derived tumor. Uh, and the epithelial, the epithelial cells within the tumor, they take on a whole new phenotype. They become like a mesenchymal cell, right? So they change. And this uh, change, this adaptive change, allows them to behave, uh, you know, quite, uh, 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 quite differently. Uh, so if you, go, if you look at uh, epithelial, uh, epithelial plasticity in regards to EMT, uh, it's actually a normal process. In nor uh, it's actually a, a very normal process, but it's commandeered again in cancer cells. For example, in embryonic cell, uh, in embryonic cell, uh, when a cell undergoes a, a mesenchymal transition, it, 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 it changes the shape of the cell, changes uh, the, the mobility of the cell. The cell can move. It becomes much more invasive. It's able to, and, and I'll show you an example. I'll show you a schematic example of that. And then when you're talking about these cells moving to the place for organ development, uh, uh, you have to have a reverse uh, plasticity. You have to have a reversion of the, uh, of the mesenchymal phenotype to an epithelial type to form the, uh, you know, to form the, uh, the, uh, the organ. Uh, wound healing, uh, very apparent wound healing. You get EMT. You you, you see, uh, you know, you see this change in the shape of the cells, the migration of them, the joining of them, and then uh, in 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 normal epithelial homostasis, you have to have the epithelial phenotype. But in cancer cells, I'll just point this out. I won't go through this. I, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. But in, 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 this EMT is very important for cancer cell dissemination. Uh, for cells to be able to disseminate, spread, uh, move to distant organs, get into the blood, extravagate uh, into the blood, into, uh, uh, into lymphatics, into vessels, uh, you need this uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition. And uh, then when it gets to distant sites, to organs, for it to really form a lesion, it must revert. So it's got to go uh, a reversion of the whole program, so a phenotypic change. So this is, a, is a, something that I took from a science article by uh, Nico uh, that, that just, uh, just very, in a very elementary way uh, shows you what's going on here. Uh, it shows you a number of things, but we'll, we'll restrict it to saying that this is the primary tumor. Uh, within the primary tumor, some cells undergo phenotypic change to go undergo from an, it, and say this is, a, this is an adult carcinoma or epithelial derived cancer. 
uh, it, it under, some of the cells undergo this EMT transition. They move away from the main uh, body of the tumor. They're able to get in the lymphatics or in the bloodstream. Uh, they, they're able to travel uh, through the bloodstream. They, they're able to escape sure pressure because they have a different, because the, uh, the subtle architecture and the subtle skeleton is organized differently. Uh, they survive. They go to a distant organ, and, and maybe they're able to interact with the microenvironment there, you know, the seed and soil hypothesis. If they're able to, and they undergo a reversion of this, uh, they're able to form, uh, they are able to grow, grow, form another lesion as a result of reversion back to to, uh, to EMT uh, to uh, uh, to an epithelial phenotype. Now, I, I want to leave you. With, I want to tell you about this concept uh, that I, I found intriguing, and I've always followed this in, in, in my 30 years in science and cancer biology. Uh, it, it's this idea that we, we have, we, we, we know that uh, metastasis, or we thought metastasis is the last step. It occurs, you go through all these processes and it's the last thing that happens. You get, uh, uh, you get these invasive cells and they allow for progression. And of course, you know that you, uh, from classical uh, cancer biology, you get some initiating event, right? Some initiating mutation. Uh, and, and of course, in, in, in some uh, hematopoietic type of cancers, uh, it, could, it could be one, one, uh, uh, one mutation. But in solid tumors, we know from the old uh, Vogelstein um, uh, Vogelstein uh, studies in genetic progression, you have a series of multiple hits. And they are the right hits to get the right combination of oncogenes, uh, uh, gain of function, and loss of function tumor suppressor genes. And, you, and with these additional mutations, you get progression. And uh, uh, the initiating mutations often are involved in genetic instability, leading to the accumulation of mutations. And this is going on all the time, right? It's, I, I'm, I'm blocking. Am I blocking? Can you see? You see? Okay. Uh, so uh, you, you know, you're getting mutations. A lot of mutations are lethal. The cells die. But in cancer, you've got to get the right combination. So ever so often, you get the right combination, and you develop the, the so-called cancer cell. And, and, and of course, you know. Uh, that this leads, this progression model uh, leads to, um, uh, you know, going from pre-malignant, pre-invasive type lesion to some weakly uh, malignant-like lesion that's non, that may also be non-invasive, uh, primary tumor, an invasive lesion, and then we, we thought, or we think, uh, and it still may be partially true, that you get a, a, a metastasis. In pancreatic cancer, it just as in colon cancer, uh, this whole process, uh, uh, and you see this all the time misprinted or misspoken in pancreatic cancer. They, people say, well, the problem with pancreatic cancer is it starts and people get it, you know, it just, uh, it happens immediately. Uh, it's, it happens so rapidly. It's not true. Uh, uh, epidemiologists now uh, claim, molecular epidemiologists claim that the time for a, uh, for a real pancreatic tumor to, progress, to go all the way to progression is probably more than 20 years. And there's all these intermediate lesions called pan-in lesions and so forth that you can detect. There's multiple uh, grades of pan-in lesions, pan-in 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, those are probably more curable, curable if you could identify them. What's the problem with that, though? I'm sorry? Knowing they're there. Oh, knowing they're there. They're knowing they're there. But not only that, is that if you look at, uh, if you look at people my age, uh, we may, uh, half of us may already have those type of lesions. And, and most of those lesions will never progress. Uh, so it's like you see in prostate cancer, right? Uh, so you can have these lesions, so what do you treat every, or what, what are you going to do? So hopefully there is a way to uh, monitor people that do have uh, pre-malignant type lesions or early uh, non-invasive lesions. But I, I think you're right, knowing they're there would be really, uh, certainly important. 
But what I want to tell you about is that I'll show you some evidence a little, in a few slides from now uh, that suggests that actually when you get a identify, when you get a primary tumor and you start to treat it, what happens is that the chemotherapy itself causes adaptive plasticity and it drives these cells to form this EMT and we'll talk about stem cell uh, cancer stem cell phenotype with high metastatic potential. And even though you may treat and regress the tumor, you're also enhancing this population of cells. And these populations of cells are, are receiving the primary tumor, and they're actually more, uh, uh, more able to spread, and they, they give rise to additional metastatic lesion. So I don't want to, I want to say, well, let's all treat patients because treating patients with chemotherapy is a good thing because you're knocking out a lot of the original tumor. It's just that in pancreatic cancer, at the, at the stage we start treating these, we're actually also, although we're arresting the tumor, to some degree killing off the bulk of the tumor, uh, we're also doing bad things. Uh, we're creating a more aggressive cell type that is going to be unresponsive to chemotherapy and that's going to spread, that, that's going to spread more, more rapidly. But if you didn't give the chemotherapy, people are going to die much, much soon, soon, sooner. So there's a reason. So, but we have to do something besides our conventional chemotherapy. Now, uh, uh, this was intriguing to me in the last two years. Uh, well, inflammation, we've known inflammation is a driver for a long time. What we didn't know was that you can have these really undetectable lesions and you develop, uh, you know, even in people with pancreatitis. Uh, you know, we know pancreatitis is, a, is a, it, with all the cytokines that, that's produced. That if there's any underlying mutation, that they can drive, uh, they can drive uh, malignant progression, and they 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 they, they drive this uh, EMT like phenotype, and we're calling these cancer. Uh, okay, so uh, be a little cautious about this term, but cancer stem cell like phen phenotype. And I'm going to show you that. EMT and cancer stem cell like phenotype, uh, there, there, there's some overlap there, right? Uh, uh, we'll talk about that in some detail. But it, this inflammation, even before you get a large primary tum tumor that you would ever treat, will drive, to, will drive uh, EMT cells that will spread and we get uh, distal metastasis, uh, 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 spread to distal sites very early. And this may be very early on in, uh, on in the process, you know, changing this kind of paradigm uh, shift. Not that these late progressed tumors that are invasive can't form more, uh, you know, uh, metastatic lesions. They certainly do. But I just want you to know there's two, uh, there's, uh, two lines of evidence for this. Uh, there's more than that, but the two common ones are. Uh, so we've treated patients for a long time that we see have they have early disease, early disease. We don't find we don't find a metastatic lesion. Uh, there's a small tumor that's discovered, uh, say uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, in the head of the pancreas uh, that's removed, and we think oh that's a good you know it's a good thing we do uh, Whipple right, and so uh, those patients do live much longer, but many of them. Uh, many, many of them have recurrent distal metastasis at some time, and that that speaks to their distal seeding early. Uh, but the other uh, interesting uh, paper uh, is cut off here. This is Realm et al. in a cell paper that was done almost two years ago now. That in, in the at least in the genetic models uh, show uh, that actually this process here. Uh, this uh, metastasis and spread uh, uh, occurs um, uh, occurs actually uh, precedes uh, the time that we can detect um, we can detect a, a primary tumor. So that goes against this uh, original kind of um, uh, paradigm that, that we've had all, all these uh, all these years. Yes, I did. I Blocking the view here. I don't know if I could, can I, if I sit, is it? Yeah, I'm okay. You're okay, I'm okay. I, I just moved, uh, I'm, a, I'm a mover, so anyway. So uh, this is another paper that really got me interested in this. And, it, it, and many, uh, some of you know uh, Bob, or Robert Weinberg's lab uh, 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 in, in Boston. 
uh, a, a very famous cancer biologist. What he showed was actually quite nicely in this cell paper, uh, uh, so all the way back in 2008, was this so-called epithelial mesenchymal transition was associated with properties of cancer stem cells. So we see all this terminology of cancer stem cells, and is it, it you know, so, you know, there's many uh, uh, definitions of this, and uh, we won't get into the classical definition, just to say that if you can induce a cell to undergo an EMT, I'm telling you that those EMT cells take on properties of stem cells. Take on some properties. I'm not saying that they're classical cancer stem cells, but they have properties of, 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 of cancer stem cells. So the idea would be that if you had um, if you had drugs that kill the majority of the tumor cells, you have tumor regression. That these cancer stem cells, these EMT cells, not only are they more mobile, but they're more resistant to chemotherapy. Uh, they stay around and they sit there. They don't grow very rapidly, uh, but eventually they regrow. So you get this initial tumor regression of the, uh, the bulk of the cells. Uh, you have these stem cells or these EMT-like cells uh, that regrow and reform the tumor. So the ideal, the classical ideal was you kill the cancer stem cell and then you can't get, you know, you just don't get uh, regeneration of new tumor cells and the tumor just falls apart. But I think that in reality you have to kill, you kill these cells if you can kill them. But you've got to kill these cells if you're going to make a significant if we're going to make a significant uh, advancement in, uh, in therapeutics. Uh, so uh, to effectively treat cancer, we must kill, the, uh, we must kill this population of cells, cells here. So cancer cells with EMT phenotype, they take on these cancer stem cell-like properties. Uh, they can reseed tu new tumors. Uh, we know this. I, I have lots of experiments I can show you that I'm not going to. They show increased expression of a transmembrane protein CD44. I want to tell you about CD44, uh, a little about CD44 today. So CD44 uh, is, a, a, is a transmembrane receptor, has no kinase activity of its own. Uh, it has a, uh, you know, it has a, uh, it has an extracellular, um, uh, large extracellular domain that binds various molecules, particularly uh, it binds uh, uh, hyaluronin. Hyaluronin is an ex is the uh, is a extracellular matrix component. It's expressed by tumor cells and stromal cells, and uh, it also binds other uh, growth factor like molecules, presents them to growth factor receptors, and so forth. But the the intracellular portion of the CD44 actually a a binds many mo adapter molecules and can initiate various cell signaling pathways and alter the phenotype of the cell. So my question is, is CD44, is it actually regulating uh, this EMT-like phenotype or having any role? So I, I wanted to, uh, uh, okay, so uh, let's uh, not do it, spend a lot of time on this. This is the uh, structure of the, uh, of the CD44 gene and protein. It's, it's, it's encoded by uh, 20 exons. Uh, it has a standard form, which actually uh, is coded for by the first five amino acids in the last five. And uh, it has these uh, CD44 variant molecules, which are created by alternate splicing of adding additional variant exon, or diff different, uh, uh, some of these diff other exons between exon 6 and 15. Uh, these are called variants, and <coughs> variants 1. Variants five, <coughs> variant six very important. Stop the very important contains exon eleven, as well as you know the standard exons, and and this shows the transmembrane protein. And these variant exons uh, end up in the juxtamembrane um, uh, portion of the molecule uh, on the extracellular surface. And uh, they've, there's a lot of information about these uh, being able to, for example, here, here's a, a CD44 variant, isoform variant that binds a growth factor HGF that activates MET, right? So what it would do is, uh, it, it, it's setting out there, the, the CD44 is, it's sequestering growth factors 
uh, in the environment and it's presenting it to the growth factor receptor facilitating and enhancing signaling. Well, that, that's, uh, at least that's what, what's believed. Uh, many other factors combine uh, to CD44, uh, but at the intracellular surface, uh, this is only one example, one of many examples. For example, once activated or bound by either HA or other factors, uh, well, in this case, uh, the ligand is HA, uh, it, it's it binds to um, uh, uh, these uh, urn-like um, uh, factors such as Ezrin, and Ezrin and these others uh, actually connect with uh, actin filaments, and they, 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 they signal from the cell surface to the, to the inside of the cell to, uh, to how the cell undergo uh, cytoskeletal changes, changing the configuration of the cell uh, and affecting its, uh, its behavior in regards to migration, uh, uh, migration and actually survival. Um, and, and as I say, this change also results in, in resistance to uh, chemotherapy. So now some actual data uh, uh, from, <laughs> actual data from, from the lab uh, what, what I have here, what I've listed here, are, are several cell lines. And, and this is a Western blot showing CD44 standard and CD44, some CD44 variants. This is probably a variant. These are variants up here. But what you notice is that, uh, what we do know is that mesenchymal cells that have undergone an EMT, uh, they express the, uh, a mesenchymal marker by methane. So these cells are, look mesenchymal-like, they don't have bimethan. They have bimethan, but they don't have e-cadherin. E-cadherin is a marker for epithelial cells. And these cells that don't have much standard, they express e-cadherin. Okay, just markers of epithelial cells or, or mesenchymal cells. So these cells, so what we noticed right away was this high level of expression of CD44 standard in the cells that are EMT-like. Uh, and uh, this is, that's Western, uh, this is PCR, and you see, interestingly, that the PCR, uh, that PCR shows that the mesenchymal like cells express high levels of CD44 standard, and there's more variants expressed in the, uh, uh, in, in the cells that have, that express uh, ECAN here, and then, and then have a, uh, have a, um, uh, epithelial phenotype. Now, I'll point out a, a, a cell. Uh, this cell is called, uh, this cell is called cell pack one uh, Look at it, it expresses e-cadherin and bimethan. So it's in between, it's, it's a cell, it's in, either in between or it's two populations of cells. Right? That's two possibilities, uh, or, or both possibilities. Or transition? Or, uh, or undergoing transition. Oh. Yeah. So that's, I thought about that, that's another possibility. Well, I'll tell you what we did. So we asked. Well, how do you culture these cells? Um, so these cells are cultured in uh, culture dishes in um, in, 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 in just regular media with serum. Okay. Yeah. Do they have any uh, different shape mark markers expressing pancreatic uh, different shape marker expressed there? Um, uh, I'm I'm trying to think of what we. Uh, uh, what you could talk about as far as level of differentiation. Yeah, uh, like amylase or this kind of Oh, yeah. So we, we really haven't looked for, okay. for these. So these cells yeah, just isolated from two. Yeah, they are isolated from two. Okay, so uh, what I want to tell you uh, is that we took this cell, line, this cell line and separated it by flow cytometry into CD44 high and low. So th these are CD44 high, these are CD44 low. We're in Western, CD44 high, has high CD44, no e-cadherin, uh, uh, but lots of romantin. So that means what? It's mesenchymal. Uh, this cell line low has, uh, has very low levels of CD44, doesn't express CD44, uh, expresses e-cadherin, and at lower levels of omethan, and it's more mesenchymal like, and you can see this. So, this cell line at CD44 high, this, cell, this, this population here, it, it, it looks mesenchymal. Uh, this cell line here, which is CD44 low, uh, looks more cobblestone like, looks more epithelial. 
Uh, and, and this cell line, CD44 high, it, it, this is an invasion assay to basement membrane, is much more, is much more invasive. Okay? And, and interestingly, uh, these cells uh, that are CD44 high, and some people consider CD44 as a marker for stem cells, these will grow as tumor spheres, which is characteristic of cancer stem cells. Uh, these cells are CD44 low, will not grow as tumor spheres. And, and they'll grow repetitively on repetitive passages. Uh, so th th this again suggests that these cells have some properties of a cancer stem cell. <coughs> so both cells can migrate in the same level? Did you test if also if both cells can migrate the same? If you do migration assay? Uh, no. Uh, so the CD44 high, mm -hmm. I, I don't have the, the uh, I, I didn't put the graph in here. Mm -hmm. But I, I just thought you could see, see this, that's a matrix gel assay. Uh, so the, these cells migrate much, much more, oh, okay. uh, much, much more than the CD44 low. CD44 low uh, don't migrate well. And CD44 high looks like a cancer stem cell uh, by classical definition. Now, what happens if we take this CD44 high and knock out uh, and knock out uh, uh, CD44 using uh, it, it means that some of you know that, but we use a genetic approach called shRNA. And uh, uh, if we knock out CD44 genetically, and we look to see what happens at the phenotype, they re-express ecoherin. So if you take this CD44 high cell, which is mesenchymal-like, knock out CD44, it looks more epithelial-like, and it expresses ecoherin, and shows decrease in by methane. And if you compare it for sensitivity to gemcitabine, you see that the, the CD44 high cell is more resistant. CD44 knockout cells are much more sensitive to chemotherapy. So if you could, you know, if you could, if you could knock out or block CD44 signaling in these cells, uh, perhaps you could revert them back. You could revert them back to an epithelial phenotype. So uh, uh, I'll go on and tell you why this is important with, with chemotherapy tr uh, treatment. But at least it makes them more sensitive to, uh, to chemotherapy. At least this chemotherapy. Okay. Uh, is this un understandable? Okay. Kind of. Okay. It, a, little, a, little too much, uh, uh, a little too much science, uh, 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 perhaps. Uh, uh, here you'll understand this uh, e e more easily. Uh, so this is actually done by a uh, fellow in the lab. Uh, so what she did was to take these CD44 high cells, puts them in the pancreas of, my, of, of new mice, and looks for, let, lets them grow for, uh, in this case, only five weeks. No, no, I'm sorry, six weeks. Uh, uh, these were four to five week old mice. Uh, and what happens is you can see that the CD44 high, uh, they form much larger tumors. Uh, than the CD44 low, and this is graphic representation of that, right? They have some advantage of growing. Uh, uh, of it. I don't know if it's actual growth after they start, uh, but I, I actually now think it's engraftment. But I, I, I don't have. It, it, it's going to take me some time to get, to explain that. So the cell injected in new mice, and then you keep it for maybe uh, three, four weeks, and then after four weeks you get the tumor out, and you. Yeah. How big true? Yeah, that's okay. exactly right. Actually, it's six weeks, I think. Six weeks. Yeah, and, and, and I don't know why she put this. this is the, the, the mice are 45 weeks old when we used them. Uh, but uh, this is, in, so we also image them. Uh, and this is just a representative. And you can see that the CD44 low, they form tumors. They even, some of them may form metastases. I pulled this one out because it looks like it has some metastases. Uh, but the, the high, the CD44 high forms tumors very quickly. And actually, at about this stage, you can see that they have ascites, so you can't image them very well. They don't image as well. But you can see by the imaging that, that, that C44 high is much larger than the CD44 low. Uh, so this is uh, luciferase imaging. We, we, yeah. Very good. But I can yeah. stop you here and just ask you, did you try at least um, at certain level of tumor, 
to inject the mice I'm with sorry? to inject the mice yeah. with some uh, chemo. It's already known. Uh, all right, so we're doing that now. Okay, great. Um, actually, we're about halfway through the experiment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I can't. Well. Sure. Yes. Okay, but the, these are livers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, these are livers from from uh, uh, from twelve different mice. These are CD forty four high low. Uh, Please, this is confusing. See these spots? Th those are not metastases, sorry. That's the camera taking picture. It's, it's, it's a reflection. I, I don't know. But the, 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 these things are, the, the, so you can see that the CD44 high, uh, most of them have, uh, most of them have, actually when we look at this in a very dark image, you can see there's a, there's a metastasis here, metastasis here. And this is surface. We, we, we do an immunohistochemistry on that, who's slicing them. But actually, 11 of the 12 of these had, had metastases. Only two of the low, uh, only two of the low ones here and here, I think, showed any uh, uh, metastases. Of course, you can argue, these are just behind because they grow slower. So you got to let these grow, have to grow longer and, and see if they, you know. It, it may just be suppressing, uh, they just may not be, uh, they just don't uptake and grow, grow as fast. But there's a difference. Uh, but uh, here's what I want to show you today, take, take on, uh, the real take home message. And, and at the end of this, I have some other slides to show you where we're going. I, maybe we won't even get to those. But I, because I, <coughs> I don't want to keep you, but um, I, I want to, to uh, tell you that so these are the same cell lines. Now we're we're looking uh, we're looking at a different cell line now called uh, VXPC3. This cell line has no uh, we didn't talk about cell one. It has ecoherin. Ecoherin is the marker for epithelial cells, and it has no vomitin. So this is an epithelial looking cell line, right? Uh, epithelial looking, very low CD44 expression. Uh, we took this cell line, we treated it, uh, so we tried to mimic what we do with patients. So we give them a, a treatment each week of gemcitabine and but then we increase the dose over time. And we don't get, we don't leave it on, uh, we give them, uh, we treat them for a day, uh, then we remove, re actually we end up removing uh, there's a reason for this. I, 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 can, I can explain sure. our scientists here. So anyway, uh, so look what happens though. Uh, as you increase the dose over time, what happens to these cells? This is at six weeks after increasing doses of gemcitabine. CD44 goes up, right? Mm -hmm. So that, and ecoherin goes away, bimethin comes up. So these become mesenchymal, they stem cell like, they, they, well, let's back up. They at least express CD44, high level CD44. They look different, they look like mesenchymal cells, whereas the parental cells, uh, they, they look, like epithelial, look like epithelial cells. So treatment with chemotherapy induces this aggressive phenotype. And it's not restricted to uh, this cell line because this cell line, CF, I showed you CF pack high and low, low, does it express CD44 or low levels of it? When, so this was 48 hour dose, increasing dose, increase CD44. This is increasing dose over weeks and you see CD44 goes up, up. So when you start treating with chemotherapy, when you start treating chemotherapy, uh, you select out a population of cells that are um, EMT-like, uh, have stem cell-like characteristics, and uh, they are more highly in invasive. And when we put these in animals, uh, they, uh, they, they, can, they form metastatic lesions uh, 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 more, more, more rapidly. But the metastatic lesions may come back and undergo a MET. And we have re evidence for that. So this plasticity is really going on. So, so what, what, the only thing I wanted to say about this in, uh, is that uh, is that EMT is depend uh, EMT is actually dependent on expression of CD44 as one. It's not maybe not the only thing, but if we can block CD44, we can block um, 
uh, you, we can block this uh, 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 transition. So, so, so targeting, uh, so targeting CD44 reverses EMT, decreases invas invasiveness, and enhances response to gemcitabine. So we're trying to understand the functional road between these different CD44. And, and what we don't know is why this drug, why this chemotherapy, and we're getting a handle on it, but we're trying to find out why treatment with chemotherapy induces this phenotype. That, that's a big, uh, a, a, a big project uh, in the lab. And we want to know if we're getting ready to treat patients with gemcitabine, what's going to happen? We treat them with gemcitabine, and they're going, hopefully they start, the tumor starts shrinking, and then the tumor starts forming these aggressive cells, the tumor grows back, and it starts spreading even more. So if we could convert, could prevent with identifying molecular targets, uh, including CD44 is one of only perhaps many, if we could target that and prevent that switch to an EMT phenotype, uh, we could do more, uh, be more effective, uh, uh, be more, but much more effective. So I want to spend, let me take 10 minutes and I'll, I'll not talk about this part, we'll, we'll, we'll cut off this part today. I, I want to tell you something about uh, really uh, uh, that's um, actually was interesting to me until I started submitting for a grant and people, and it, it, it involves microRNAs and it, 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 the complexity of microRNAs and their target genes are so complex that grant people don't always like this. So anyway, uh, uh, we we took the BX, uh, the uh, the cell line model that was gemcitabine resistant, compared it to, to the parental cell line that's gemcitabine sensitive, <coughs> and, and did uh, microRNA uh, profiling. And, and, and what we what, what we, fed, we we ended up selecting a six microRNA signature that was specific. It was specific for uh, those cells that were uh, resistant. And then we went to the uh, TCGA database, Total Cancer Genomic Atlas database from the NCI, and tried to correlate it with patients with advanced cancer. And I'll show you just a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that data. So microRNA, microRNAs, everybody, any, anyone knows microRNAs? What microRNAs do? So uh, it, it, interesting, you're going to see this come out in, in medicine more and more. So microRNAs are these small uh, 20 to 25 nucleotides in length. They're, they're coded for by the genome, and they actually regulate gene expression, either negatively or positively, depending on if they, if they directly bind the gene, gene of interest, if they divide, if they divide, the, uh, uh, bind the gene of interest, they usually bind at the, uh, bind at the 3 prime UTR and they prevent transcriptional repression uh, or promote transcriptional repression or they call cleavage of, uh, of the microRNA. So, uh, so they can shut down and these normally occur in the body. Cancer cells, microRNAs get, uh, uh, become aberrant. A, a uh, they're either up or down regulated, and they regulate gene expression. And a lot of people think they can be targets, or their genes can be target. So I know this may be, uh, maybe this should be uh, done as a separate, um, as a separate uh, talk because uh, you could under it be easier to understand. But what we came up with by comparing uh, cell lines that are are gemcitabine sensitive versus those that are, are, were made resistant, is that they express a panel of about eight microRNAs that are overexpressed and nine microRNAs that were underexpressed. And we verified many of these by qPCR. For example, let's just take a mere one, uh, microRNA 125 and 100. Uh, they are overexpressed in the gemcitabine resistant cell line. And if you take uh, these two, 455 and 27, they are underexpressed in uh, they are underexpressed in the resistant cell model. So let's just look at two of these. So what we did was to take uh, 43 data from 43 patients from the TCGA database and show that in advanced pancreatic cancer, near 100, and the red dots means overexpressed. 
Zero is normalized to normal tissue, and below that, the green dots means underexpressed. Look at this, 43, almost all of the 43, except for two, are overexpressed in advanced pancreatic cancer. In, in MIR 125B, which has a two isoforms, uh, mostly all overexpressed. So these microRNAs, uh, uh, were, uh, 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 125B and 100, that are overexpressed, as you see on this heat map, and by QPCR, are also overexpressed in advanced pancreatic cancer. So this suggests that patients that have adv very advanced disseminated disease already have these, this, adap this adaptive plasticity with the formation of all of these uh, EMT-like cells uh, in cancers and uh, cells that mimic cancer stem cells. And these cells are much more aggressive and much more resistant to... So this is individual pain? Individual, individual patients. It's so, not a longitudinal follow-up to uh, tumor. No. So this patient, this patient we done, uh, uh, MI, uh, uh, microRNA profiling was done, and one of these patients uh, represent, uh, one of these, uh, uh, so these patients, uh, 41 of 43, show over uh, uh, over expression of that microRNA but the beauty of it is here well not here but two slides are over so uh, let, let, let me just say what we did and I, I won't give you much longer I'm not going to go through the last very last part of this what I wanted to tell you was that we're trying to find out targets right for killing the EMT like cells so uh, these that are overexpressed are going to target uh, tumor suppressor genes and knock them out, we, 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 we believe. So what happens if we just target uh, a MIR 125B? So MIR 125B overexpressed in advanced cancer. Uh, so if we target it with something called an anti-MIR, it's, it's essentially anti-sense to uh, MIR 125B, essentially what we do is knock down 125B. If we knock down 125B, look what happens. CD44 expression goes down, vomitin goes down, e can hear and goes up. Partially reverses the phenotype. Uh, look what happens to sensitivity to gemcitabine. This is, so this is the gemcitabine resistant cell line, high CD44, resistant to increasing concentrations of gemcitabine. What happens to the parental cell line, very sensitive to gemcitabine? By partially knocking out 125B, only one of a number of microRNAs that are overexpressed, what happens? They become more sensitive to gemcitabine. Not, so it's not a complete reversion. So one microRNA is not sufficient. Knocking out one microRNA is not sufficient to make it completely sensitive or completely a epithelial, uh, revert to an epithelial phenotype, but to partially uh, revert it. So what's, what are the target genes for mir 125B? The target genes uh, we've looked at here, and this is MIR-125B, again, showing that most are overexpressed in this group of 40 patients, uh, and this is normal pancreas tissue. And we looked at potential five, uh, seven uh, potential target genes. Of the seven target genes, five of the target genes appear to be uh, underexpressed, suggesting, but not proving, that these microRNAs are knocking down the expression of these, of these genes. And to show that, we've just taken two of them, uh, uh, BBC3, which is called, also called Puma, and NU1. These turn out to be all tumor suppressor genes. And what happens if, if you look at the parental cell, it expresses Puma. If you, if you look at the gemcitabine resistant, Puma goes away. If you knock down near 125B, Puma is re-expressed. Re uh, the same thing for new one. So it, 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 just by regulating this one microRNA, we can have a dramatic effect. So what we're trying to do is to identify, uh, uh, what we're trying to do is identify new target genes so that we can more effectively uh, uh, we, so we can pre prevent the ability of key, uh, the, the effects of key, adverse effects of chemotherapy on inducing an aggressive phenotype. So that if we can, can, can prevent that transition, 
uh, we should have to be more, more, much more effective at treating patients with conventional uh, uh, therapeutics. And uh, uh, we're, we're running out of time, I'm not going to show you. This is a lot of data we actually did with uh, Sunil Ahuja. Uh, but we've actually uh, did very similar work using RNA-seq. We've looked up to 17,000 genes identified at least four or five interesting candidate genes uh, that may be very good targets for blocking, uh, for blocking this conversion uh, uh, to EMT. So what I, I wanted to tell you is that we generally treat patients with pancreatic cancer with, with chemotherapy, uh, and we, pre, we treat these primary, uh, primary tumors and uh, inflammation is playing a role. And, and although we're, not, we're often knocking down the size of these tumors, uh, we're also creating a, a resistant population that's more highly aggressive. And that we have to find a way uh, to actually prevent this process here from occurring. If we can prevent this from occurring, uh, we can do a much more effective job with, with chemotherapy. So we can block inflammation is one approach. Blocking, finding new markers, new targets, therapeutic targets, such as the, the microRNAs that I've shown you, such as CD44, such as some of the other molecular targets. We hope to be able to uh, improve their, hope to be able to uh, improve therapeutic, uh, uh, therapeutic outcomes. Uh, so this tells you uh, these are people that are, are currently uh, currently in my, in my lab. Uh, these are lab members. Catherine Chang is a um, is a Hemoc fellow who's working in in the lab this year. We have a number of uh, collaborators. Sunil Ahuja, I, uh, I, I I left off of here, but it was really important in this last part, which we really didn't I uh, didn't uh, uh, did not um, talk about. So uh, I, I apologize if there was a little to uh, uh, to uh, laboratory uh, based in some ways, but I hope you get some idea to the changing paradigms in, in cancer therapeutics, uh, and that uh, and not to say that chemotherapy is bad. Chemotherapy is good, uh, but uh, chemotherapy has adverse effects on inducing a more malignant phenotype in resistant cell populations. And we have to be able to do better in pancreatic cancer, which is a disease of the aged, uh, before we do any better uh, in, in providing, although we have some new regimens that are slightly better, we're, we're still, not, still not curing these, uh, uh, certainly curing these patients. So the, the big advances, I think, have been in, in, in palliative care of these patients and uh, uh, some uh, new protocols that, that have uh, slightly increased survival. Uh, but uh, I, I think we still have opportunities here uh, by looking at the change, uh, changes in, in, in paradigm in the way that we look at these tumors uh, to do a, a better job uh, 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 clinically. Uh, so I hope you at least um, th th there was some take home message uh, uh, from the talk that, uh, that, 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 may, uh, that may stick with you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Questions? All right. I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, don't forget to sign in if you haven't done so already. Oh, sorry. All right. Chips. Yeah, so...